This video is inspired by a comment from Martha. She's one of my viewers. I'd like to thank Martha for her kind comments about my Poncho Villa video. And I hope you enjoy this one as well. Now the seeds for the Veracruz incident can be traced back to the overthrow of Francisco Madero. Uh, this event is known as the Ten Tragic Days. Now the coup d'etat began on February 9, 1913 with rebel forces bombarding the National Palace. Realizing the situation was hopeless on February 18, 1913, Madero surrendered to the rebels with the mistaken belief that he would go into exile. Yep. Now, his top general, Vittorio Juana, had other plans for Madero. You see, Huerta had gone over to the rebel forces, and once the coup was successful, he declared himself as president. Now, the kicker to this rebellion was the fact that President Taft supported the coup as well as American business interests. They favored a strong authoritarian leader in Mexico. Now, Huerta needed to clean up loose ends, so on the night of February 22, 1913, Madero and his vice president were being transferred from the National Palace to the city's penitentiary, where they were murdered. Now, the story put out by Huerta's government was that they died during a failed rescue attempt. They kind of ran towards the people shooting at them. Well, the election of 1912 in the United States ushered in a new leader for America. On March 4, 1913, President Woodrow Wilson took the oath of office. Wilson's attitude towards the Huerta government was less than friendly. He considered Huerta illegitimate and made it his sacred duty to, and I quote, teach the South American republics to elect good men. Wilson signaled his intentions towards Huerta in his State of the Union address on December 2, 1913. There can be no certain prospect of peace in America until General Huerta has surrendered his usurped authority. Shortly thereafter, Wilson lifted the arms embargo, which would then allow the Constitutionalistas under the leadership of Venustiano Carranza to buy arms to fight Huerta. Now, the port of Tampico was held by Huerta's forces, but it was under siege by the Constitutionalist forces of Carranza. Wilson sent the 5th Division and part of the 3rd Division of the Atlantic Fleet to Tampico to protect American lives and business interests. The 5th Division consisted of the battleships Connecticut, Minnesota, and the cruisers Chester and Des Moines, as well as Mayo's flagship, the gunboat USS Dolphin. Now, the 3rd Division sent the battleship Florida and Utah. By April of 1914, the fighting in and around Tampico was becoming dangerous. American citizens had to be evacuated to American ships in the harbor. On April 9, 1914, Admiral Mayo's flagship USS Dolphin was running low on fuel for their auxiliary generator. So a small detachment of nine American sailors under the command of Ensign Charles C. Cope were sent ashore to pick up the gasoline that they'd already paid for. Now, while on their way to get the gasoline, it seemed they wandered into an area that was put off limits to all foreigners. The Americans didn't speak English and the Mexicans didn't speak, I'm sorry, the Americans didn't speak Spanish and the Mexicans didn't speak English. So the inevitable happened. The junior officer commanding the American Mexican forces arrested the shore party as well as the two sailors in the motor whale boat which was flying the American flag at the time. Admiral Mayo, the commander of the U.S. forces stationed off the port of Tampico, was incensed. So he did what any self-respecting admiral in the U.S. Navy would do. He sent a strongly worded note to General Zaragoza, the commanding officer of the Jurista forces, who were resisting the Constitutionalists in Tampico at the time. Mayo's official communique on April 9, 1914 can be found in the Department of State's papers relating to Foreign Relations Office of the Historian. Mayo laid out the facts of the incidents, incident, then went on to state, I do not need to tell you that taking men from a boat flying the American flag is a hostile act, not to be excused. I have already received your verbal message of regret that this event had happened, and your statement that it was committed by an ignorant officer. The responsibility for hostile acts cannot be avoided by the plea of ignorance. In view of the publicity of this occurrence, I must require that you send me, by suitable members of your staff, formal disavowal of and an apology for the act, together with your assurance that the officer responsible for it will receive severe punishment. 
and also that you publicly hoist the American flag in a prominent position on shore and salute it with 21 guns, which salute will be duly returned by this ship. Your answer to this communication should reach me and the call for salute be fired within 24 hours from 6 p.m. of this date. Mayo had also sent a brief synopsis of the incident and his demand to General Zaragoza to the Secretary of the Navy, who in turn sent it to the Secretary of State. Following day, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryant, who, by the way, was an avowed pacifist and didn't like war or violence of any kind, forwarded the report to President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson concurred with Admiral Mayo's actions, with a written endorsement stating, I don't see that Mayo could have done otherwise. Unless the guilty persons are promptly punished, consequences of gravest and gravest sort might ensue. At the time of the incident, the president was in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. His wife, Ellen, was ill with Bright's disease, and he wanted to get her out of Washington for a few days, hence the telegram exchanges. Now, this caused Wilson to be woefully informed of the details of the incident. Telegrams were sent back and forth between Secretary of State, uh, and, uh, Nelson, between Secretary of State and Nelson O'Shaughnessy, Chargé d'Affaires, at interim in Mexico City, and Admiral Fletcher, commander of the U.S. Florida. Radio was in its infancy at the time, and all messages had to be relayed through Key West to Washington. The Dolphin did not have the equipment to send the messages. The USS Florida did. Now, at 5 p.m. April 10th, Admiral Fletcher sent a message to Nelson O'Shaughnessy, charge affair in Mexico City, informing him that the gravity of the offense be explained to Huerta and promise of ample reparations be obtained to avoid forcing the issue locally at Tampico. O'Shaughnessy, understanding the situation, took matters into his own hands and went to General Huerta. He cabled Washington at 8 p.m. April 10th. I called on General Huerta and explained to him the gravity of the matter. The General gave O'Shaughnessy a written statement stating, Mexico deplores what has occurred in this case, which has grown out of nothing more than a misunderstanding by a subordinate official. Huerta stated that if the investigation which is to be made should develop a greater responsibility on the part of Colonel Hisanosa, the appropriate penalties will be imposed upon him by the competent authorities. The State Department, unaware of O'Shaughnessy's meetings with Huerta, sent a cable gram at 9 p.m. on April 10th. The President directs that you present the matter at once to the Foreign Office with utmost firmness, earnestness, and frankness, representing to them the extreme seriousness of the situation and the possibility that the gravest consequences may ensue unless guilty parties are promptly punished, inform us of reply made and actions taken. This is over a flag salute. So on April 11th at 1 p.m., O'Shaughnessy cabled the State Department. Will the promise received by me from Huerta, which I have further received in a signed note from the Foreign Office as a statement of the President, if carried out, be satisfactory? I am not acting on your 7.40, April 10th, 9 p.m. until I again hear from you. He went on to inform the State that the Minister of Foreign Affairs is in Guadalajara until Monday, and the entire machinery of government is at standstill owing to the Holy Week. In the meantime, Admiral Fletcher transmits two messages to the Secretary of the Navy. The first message was sent on April 11th, 2 p.m., in which he confirms the details of the incident reported by Admiral Mayo. Fletcher then went on and added his own assessment of the situation. I am of the opinion that there is ample justification for the demands made by Mayo, and that taking of men from a naval boat flying the American flag is a hostile act which cannot be excused by a plea of ignorance, nor the part of a commissioned Mexican officer. Undue delay in complying with demands to salute American flag only intensifies the situation and retaliatory measures, even to the seizing of a Mexican gunboat, would not be excessive under the circumstances. Taking a gunboat because they didn't salute the flag. Right. Admiral Mayo's report to the Secretary of the Navy via Admiral Fletch Fletcher on board the USS Florida April 11th, 3 p.m., Mayor reports, General Zago 
Zagarosa has sent me an official letter expressing regret over the arrest of both crew, stating it was due to the ignorance of an officer, but with reference to other stipulation, has asked 24 hours delay on account of poor communications to consult his government's request being reasonable was granted. Signed, Mayo. Now, meanwhile, back at the State Department, a telegram was sent out at 9 p.m. on April 11th to O'Shaughnessy. I communicated Admiral Mayo's ultimatum to the President, and he approved demand made. The statement by Huerta, as quoted in your number 841 message, April 10th, 8 p.m., does not meet the last part of the demand, and I notified Mr. Algara, the Mexican showers here, of this fact about noon today. The government appreciates, however, the difficulties of securing prompt action during the religious exercises connected with Holy Week, and if General Huerta gives this as a reason for not having complied, this government will direct Admiral Mayo to extend the time until Monday evening. Signed, Brian. Now, Wilson had turned this minor incident into an affair of honor. He was looking for any reason, no matter how weak, to destabilize Huerta's regime. Between April 11th and April 14th, telegrams were flying back and forth in all directions. Secretary of the Navy to Fletcher, O'Shaughnessy to State, Secretary of the Navy to Secretary of State, Secretary of State to Wilson in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. The sticking point was the salute to the American flag. Huerta refused. He had apologized. He had the officer in charge arrested. He had promised a full investigation of all parties involved on the Mexican side. Yet Wilson was not satisfied. Now, to add to this incident was the holding up of a diplomatic cable to O'Shaughnessy on April 12th and a cable from U.S. Consul William Canada in Veracruz stating at about 10.15 yesterday morning while on duty ashore at the post office building here, a mail orderly from the USS Minnesota in full uniform with the official mailbag across his shoulder was arrested by a policeman at the orders of a Mexican soldier and taken to jail. After being questioned, the Jefe Politico released the orderly and then locked up the soldier. I shall investigate the matter and report. Whether this was due to Wilson being 250 miles away in White Sulphur Springs or his arrogance that he believed he had the right to remove Huerta because he believed Huerta was illegitimate and was the leader of a government of brutes, no one can say for sure. However, the issue was coming to a head. On April 12th, at 12 p.m., Secretary Bryant sent Charge O'Shaughnessy the following telegram. I prefer not to answer definitely until after the President returns, which will be about 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. At the same time, Secretary of the Navy sent Admiral Fletcher a similar message. No action will be decided one way or the other until the President arrives. Direct Mayo not to press salute until ordered. While the diplomatic negotiations were going on behind the scenes, the American people were following the incident in the press. Now, the Daily Missoulian, April 11, 1914 edition, printed, American Marines taken in Tampico. They were sailors, not Marines. Although President Huerta has officially apologized, there exists great uneasiness tonight because Admiral Mayo is reported to have given the authorities at Tampico until 6 p.m. this evening to salute the American colors. By April 14th, the bureaucratic machine was already in high gear. Secretary of State Brian sent O'Shaughnessy the following message. Secretary of the Navy has advised flag officers at Hampton Roads to proceed with least possible delay to Tampico with all available ships, including the battleships, Michigan, Louisiana, New Hampshire, Carolina, Arkansas, Vermont, New Jersey, cruises Tacoma, Nashville, and Hancock. The latter will carry the 1st Regiment of the Expeditionary Force of Marines. This information was given to the press by the Secretary of the Navy about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Talk about overkill. Now, the Navy was ready to invade once the diplomatic negotiations ended. The El Paso Herald, in their April 17th edition, states, U.S. insists on full salute. Secretary Bryan ordered Mr. O'Shaughnessy to formally inform Puerta that the United States will accept nothing less then a salute of 21 guns. That the American ships will reply after the salute has been fired. The following day, the El Paso Times reported, Sunday is the final date for the salute. The President announces that unless Huerta salutes American flag at Tampico before Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, 
He will go before Congress Monday for authority to take all necessary steps. On April 20th, the President met with the press before his joint session with Congress. Now, the Rock Island Argus, April 20th edition, quoted Wilson, Don't get the impression that we are going to war with Mexico. We are its friend. I'm going to Congress to tell of a special situation and request approval of plans to meet that special situation. This is only a situation between this government and the person calling himself President of Mexico. Wilson went to Capitol Hill and he addressed Congress. He went through the litany of insults that led to his decision to use military force in Mexico. He then said, a series of incidents have recently occurred which cannot be, which cannot but create the impression that the representatives General Huerta were willing to go out of their way to show disregard for the dignity and rights of this government and felt perfectly safe in doing what they pleased making free to show in many ways their irritation and contempt. Wilson went on to justify his request for using force by going after Huerta himself. General Huerta has set his power up in the city of Mexico such as it is without right and by methods for which there can be no justification. Only part of the country is under his control. If armed conflict should unhappily come as a result of his attitude of personal resentment towards this government, we should be fighting only General Huerta and those who adhere to him and give him their support. And our objective would be only to restore to the people of the distracted republic the opportunity to set up again their own laws and their own government. Wilson concludes with, I therefore come to ask your approval that I should use the armed forces of the United States in such a way and to such an extent as may be necessary to obtain from General Huerta and his adherents the fullest recognition of the rights and dignities of the United States even admits even um, <laughs> admits the distressing conditions now unhappily obtaining in Mexico. Now the revolution now, the resolution passed the House the same day, 323 to 29. The Senate took a little longer. Now Don Wolfensburg's essay for the Wilson Center related how Senator George Norris, a Republican of Nebraska, deployed the demand by Wilson of the flag salute from small countries, predicting that a hundred years from now, when the world has advanced farther in civilization, this silly custom, this foolish rule, this international courtesy that has been outlived its usefulness will be forgotten and will be unknown, at least in practice. An interesting fact that Wolfsburg uncovered in Colonel House's diary, who was the aide to President Wilson, was the fact that Wilson agreed with Senator Norris. House's diary entry of April 15, 1904, House recommended that Admiral Mayo be warned never again to do what he did at Tampico without first referring the matter to Washington. He should remember that the wireless has done away with the necessity for a commander to act on his own initiative. Now the President agreed to this. House illustrated his point by saying that such things were as obsolete as dueling. Wilson was so intent upon his moral crusade to teach the South American republics to elect good men that he didn't even wait for the Senate to vote on his resolution before occupying Veracruz. At 9 p.m. on April 20th, the U.S. Consul William Canada to Venezuela sent, I'm um, sorry, to Veracruz sent the following message to Secretary of State Brian. Schema Wyapan, owned by Hamburg American Line, will arrive tomorrow from Germany with 200 machine guns and 50 million cartridges. We'll go to Pier 4 and start discharging at 10.30. There will be 30 cars on the pier to load the munitions of war Direct from the steamer, trains of 10 cars each will be sent out over the Mexican Railroad, Railway as soon as loaded. William Canada's telegram to Secretary Bryan gave Wilson the excuse he needed to occupy Veracruz. Bryan sent the following telegram to Canada at 4 a.m. April 21st. Fletcher has been instructed to take the Customs House immediately and prevent delivery of arms and ammunition. Confer with Fletcher. Fletcher. This dispatch sent as a matter of precaution for fear the dispatch should directly to him might be delayed, immediate action necessary. America went into Veracruz because of an affair of honor, as the title of Richard Quirk's book on the occupation so aptly states. Wilson wanted regime change. He used the excuse of Mexico not saluting the flag to impose his moral and paternal beliefs on a sovereign nation. On July 15, 1914, Huerta resigned from the office of President of Mexico. Was, Vilches, was Wilson's adventure into Veracruz 
the main reason for Huerta's resignation? Most likely not. However, Wilson, as commander-in-chief, realized something very important. His decision sent men to their death. James Lindsay, writing for the Council on Foreign Relations blog April 2014, wrote, when he called reporters to the White House on April 23rd to announce the casualties from the operation, one reporter described him as pale, almost parchment. The death of American sailors and marines, owing to an order of his, seemed to affect him like an ailment. He was positively shaken. The Veracruz incident was badly handled by President Wilson. There are a number of reasons why. His wife, Ellen, was extremely ill, which was a major distraction to him. As mentioned before, his paternalistic and moral attitude towards South American republics. But I believe the main reason was Wilson's arrogance and belief that only he could teach Latin America to elect good men. To this day, depending on what side of the border you are on, the Veracruz incident is seen as either an intervention slash occupation or an invasion. The occupation of Veracruz lasted only seven months. The last American troops left on November 23, 1914. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, please ring the bell, and leave a comment below. Thank you for watching.